Welcome back to Structures Unchained, your weekly deep dive into the world's most ambitious megaprojects. Just north of Doha, Qatar is drawing a second city onto the map, Lusail, a 38-square-kilometer smart city with its own skyline, tram network, and artificial islands built for nearly half a million people. Today, we're not just touring Lusail's towers. We're tracing the system that makes it possible, the gas field paying for it, the record-breaking bridge and tunnel link meant to fuse it to Doha, and the World Cup stadiums still trying to prove they're more than a one-month spectacle. Lusail City lies about 20 kilometers north of Doha, stretched along 28 kilometers of waterfront. It's not a single development, but an entire urban plan. 19 mixed-use districts, four man-made islands, two large park systems, and a business core. Planning documents put the cost at roughly $45 billion and the footprint at 38 square kilometers, making it Qatar's largest real estate project and one of the biggest planned cities in the Middle East. The long-term goal? 200,000 residents, 170,000 workers, and 80,000 daily visitors. A floating population of around 450,000 in a country of less than 3 million. Lusail is designed as a 15-minute city. Each district gets its own schools, clinics, mosques, and retail. Crescent Park and Wadi Park act as green lungs through the urban fabric. Below the streets, tunnels carry chilled water and vacuum waste. Above, a light rail and tram network links Lusail to the Doha Metro's red line and eventually the wider Gulf Rail vision. At the symbolic center is Lusail Stadium, the 80,000-seat venue for the 2022 World Cup Final, now being downsized and reconfigured into a mixed-use hub with retail, sports, and education facilities. Around it, towers in the marina and plaza districts rise over new marinas, hotels, and residential blocks. The Kataifan Islands bring resort-style development out into the Gulf. Lusail was meant to be finished by 2025, but like most megacities, it's still a work in progress, with some districts humming and others still under construction. Lusail is Qatar's attempt to turn gas wealth into long-lived urban capital, a parallel city spreading growth beyond Doha's core. Right now, Doha and Lusail are mostly linked by conventional expressways along the coast. The proposed Shark Crossing aims to change that, with one of the Gulf's most ambitious transport projects. The concept, three large sculptural bridges tied together by subsea tunnels, spanning about 12 kilometers across Doha Bay. The alignments would connect Hamad International Airport to West Bay, Katara Cultural Village, and the Lusail Corridor, creating new north-south routes that bypass congested bottlenecks. Early designs by Santiago Calatrava's office imagined sweeping, cable-stayed structures lit at night, with integrated promenades and skyline views. Cost estimates hover around $2 billion, putting it firmly in national prestige territory, rather than a typical road scheme. After being shelved for years, Shark Crossing was formally revived by Qatar's public works authority, Ashgal, with references in 2024 to 2025 planning documents and local press, though no publicly committed opening date yet as of November 2025. If built, it would do more than cut travel times. It would physically bind Doha, West Bay, and Lusail into a single waterfront corridor, turning what were separate clusters into one elongated urban spine. Shark Crossing is the missing hardware that could turn Lusail from a satellite into a fully integrated extension of Doha's metro system. None of this glass, steel, or concrete exists without what sits offshore, the North Field, the world's largest known natural gas field, which Qatar shares with Iran. Today, Qatar's LNG industry can produce about 77 million tons per year. The North Field expansion, split into east and south phases, aims to raise capacity to 126 million tons once all six new LNG trains are online. That's an increase of roughly 85 percent, 
cementing Qatar's place among the top global LNG exporters well into the 2030s. Construction is centered at Ras Lafon Industrial City, north of Doha. Each new megatrain produces about 8 million tons of LNG per year, plus significant byproducts, condensates, LPGs, ethane, and helium. International partners, including Total Energies, Shell, ExxonMobil, ConocoPhillips, ENI, Sinopec, and CNPC are locked into supply contracts stretching 20 to 27 years. Timelines have shifted slightly. Initially, first gas was expected in late 2025. As of late 2025, Qatar Energy's CEO says LNG output will begin in the second half of 2026 with full capacity reached in 2027. The delay is tied to earlier COVID-era slowdowns, not recent geopolitical tensions. For Qatar, the Northfield expansion is the financial backbone of every project in this episode. Revenues help fund Lucille's towers and transit, national infrastructure, foreign investments, and the post-World Cup stadiums. While the world debates energy transitions, Qatar is betting that gas, the cleanest fossil fuel will stay in demand long enough to fund its urban transformation. Hosting the 2022 FIFA World Cup required eight major venues, seven of them effectively new or fully rebuilt at a cost of about $6.5 billion for stadiums alone. Qatar's big promise, these wouldn't become the white elephants that often follow mega events. Each stadium was given a legacy plan at Al Bayt, the 60,000-seat Bedouin tent-inspired stadium was built with a removable upper tier, reducing capacity to 32,000 and freeing up space for a hotel, health center, and community facilities. Lucille Stadium, the Golden Bowl where Argentina and France played one of the most dramatic finals in World Cup history, is also set to be partially de-seated and converted into a mixed-use venue surrounded by shops, cafes, athletic spaces, and education facilities. Then there's Stadium 974, the modular arena built from 974 shipping containers and a demountable steel frame. It was promoted as the first fully dismantleable World Cup stadium, meant to be reassembled in another country. But as of late 2025, satellite imagery and reporting show it's still standing, now hosting events like the FIFA Intercontinental Cup and domestic league matches, while Qatar weighs its options. A 2025 review of the stadium's second lives notes that several, including Al Bayt and Education City, are now embedded in mixed-use districts with parks, hospitality, and public amenities. Still, converting such monumental venues into financially sustainable neighborhood anchors remains a long-term challenge. Qatar's stadium legacy is a live test of whether mega-event architecture can evolve into useful civic infrastructure, or if some venues inevitably become oversized monuments to a one-month tournament. Put together, these stadium projects tell one story. If their legacy plans hold, they become cultural anchors instead of stranded costs. Qatar is trying to compress into a few decades what most countries take a century to build an energy-driven city-state with a diversified economy and global-scale infrastructure. The risk is clear. It all hinges on gas markets that will eventually peak, but the ambition is undeniable. In future episodes, we'll explore how other countries are attempting similar transformations with different tools. From Saudi Arabia's linear cities to Southeast Asia's flood defense megaprojects. Subscribe to Structures Unchained, and I'll see you in the next city.